Actually, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you wouldn't mind finding your seats, please. Um, up next, we have Ryan Zurer. He is a general partner with Polychain Capital. Ryan's an experienced senior executive and investor with a breadth of international experience focused on blockchain, distributed consensus systems, and machine learning. Uh, Ryan works to realize outlier returns for stakeholders in token-enabled decentralized consensus networks that, lever that leverage blockchain technology. After a decade working in renewable energy focused on negotiation, development, execution, and operation of utility-scale renewable generation assets, Ryan discovered Bitcoin in late 2012 and subsequently became very passionate about the Ethereum ecosystem and blockchain technology in general. Ryan began as an angel investor supporting startups that developing, <clears throat> uh, that developing deeply compelling uh, innovations with blockchain-enabled networks. Today, Ryan's focus is on finding great projects and technical teams that could realize significant network effects with the right tokenization strategy for the Polychain Capital Fund, as well as finding great in investment partners to help Polychain Capital continue its outlier growth. Welcome to Ryan. Sure. Thanks. So uh, thanks to Tyler and everyone here at uh, Rice for, for the invitation. Um, this is wonderful because I get to talk about the sort of the nexus of my two uh, passions in life, uh, energy and blockchain. Um, and when I talk about energy, I'm talking about electricity. And uh, when I talk about electricity, I usually like to talk about the future, and that is uh, electricity from renewable sources. Um, so you may be asking sort of, you know, uh, who the hell is this guy? Um, so some kind of mandatory qualifications. Uh, Polychain Capital, which is the fund that I operate together with uh, Olaf Carlson Wee, is a blockchain token only uh, hedge fund. Uh, so we do not take equity positions. We do not trade debt instruments. Uh, we're exclusively focused on this blockchain tokenization movement. Um, and that's been very compelling for, for us and our, our investors. Uh, prior to that, I spent about a decade in um, energy working in on four continents, uh, deploying a little over a gigawatt of renewable energy, but also uh, working in distribution uh, and technology evaluation, mostly centered around um, uh, energy storage systems, uh, which I'll get into uh, a little bit later on. Um, so quickly about Polychain and what we're excited about. Uh, obviously, we you know we're excited about tokens be expanding beyond the breadth of, of just Bitcoin uh, and the, the wonderful use cases that have popped up along the way. Uh, and it, more so, we're excited about what's coming on the horizon that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, the most interesting token use cases, the most interesting projects in the space are probably things that we, that we haven't even dreamed up of yet. We're really at the knee of an exponential curve in this tokenization movement. I often find myself saying that Prior to 2016, we saw a few uh, token crowd funds, uh, three specifically. Um, in 2016, depending on how you uh, sort of rate projects, sort of eliminating scams, we saw about 62. And by 2020, we will see thousands. Um, so really, it's, uh, it's an interesting moment in, in this space, and we're really excited about it. Um, but moving back to energy and kind of my previous life in energy, I, there's a couple of sort of lessons learned along the way that I'd like to share today. If you're thinking about a blockchain project um, in kind of the energy space, I think it's a tremendous opportunity, obviously. Um, energy is a massive business that's unfortunately hampered by a number of inefficiencies that blockchain can, can uh, create significant value for. Um, however, uh, there's a couple things that we should we should know uh, about energy and, and blockchain together. So, one is that the development timelines in the energy business are dramatically different from blockchain. Uh, I often find myself saying that I've never seen or heard of an industry that moves as fast as blockchain. Uh, my partner took a, a vacation a couple weeks ago uh, for two weeks, and I said to him, you know. 
don't worry. Uh, you know, you'll be out two weeks, and when you come back, the entire world will have changed. Um, whereas in energy, you could probably take six months or a year off, and not much has, uh, will have changed when, when you come back. Um, one interesting sort of anecdotal evidence of, of this is the smart meter. So the smart meter is 20-year-old technology at this point. Um, it is a no-brainer investment for the consumer and for the utility in almost um, on almost all nodes in the entire world, but with the exception of very low-income individuals, uh, it's, it, it, it makes sense for, for almost all consumers, uh, and it also makes sense for the utilities. And if you add uh, an internet portal to it, it makes sense for basically everybody. Um, even though it's a no-brainer technology that's mature 20 years old, its penetration rates are surprisingly low. Um, here in the US, it's kind of just in the past year, past a third, um, globally, it is still under 10% uh, penetration. And um, so we must recognize this lesson learned that if you're going to implement something, uh, in some kind of blockchain solution in the energy space, it's got to be very compelling value add. And then you should also still plan for, you know, a decade long or, or decades long implementation strategy uh, and, and recognize that that's just the reality of this game. Um, however, I'll get in, into this a little bit more in a, in a minute, but utilities are willing to spend money. Um, it's not that utilities aren't spending money on, on smart meters. They are. Uh, it's just that the rollout is, uh, is a very prolonged uh, procedure. Um, now, I should say just sort of generally, I'm, I'm talking generally in a global context here. Um, your specific state may be different than, than what I'm citing here. And, that's fine. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I've worked on a couple of different continents in, in energy, and uh, I'm trying to sort of synthesize less, lessons learned down. ERCOT, specifically here in Texas, has a bit of uh, some differences, but generally, what we see globally is that generation is a private open market. Often, um, uh, it's all, uh, often open auctions, and that's a, that's a space that is obviously open to, to interesting innovation. Transmission are sort of semi-closed markets with a bit more government, government intervention. And then distribution is usually either a regulated monopoly or has direct government um, involvement. And evaluating those three spaces along the value chain, it's a lot easier to um, deploy new innovation where there's open private markets than government controlled monopolies. Um, also, we should appreciate the reality of the decision makers in the space. So one story I, I often cite is in 2007, I worked with my mentor uh, on a energy or storage evaluation project for a large uh, Danish energy company. And we took about eight months and spent a lot of money um, based out of Singapore, looking at all the different types of energy storage out there. Solid state, liquid, um, at that time, and now I'm dating myself a little bit, people were really excited about supercapacitors. Hydrogen was still in vogue at that time. Um, so we spent a long time looking at all this stuff and came to the very boring conclusion at the end of it all that um, pumped hydro remained the cheapest version of utility scale energy storage and would be for a decade. Now today we're actually right around now, we're about a decade from that moment. And um, uh, that is the case and it has been the case. Um, however, there is some really interesting stuff starting to happen in, in energy storage. But at that time that was an uninteresting conclusion for the Danish executives that we were pre presenting to. Because I don't know if anybody understands uh, Scandinavian geography, but all the hydro resources are in Norway, and all the wind resources and, and uh, uh, some of the other renewables are, are based in Denmark. And these Danes were angry that we were going to give all the power away to the Norwegians. Well, get these guys out of here. They're just going to give all the money to the Norwegians. Um, so my mentor ended up getting fired for that, for that um, project and conclusion, and, and the whole project ended up getting shut down for such a boring conclusion that was going to give all the power away to foreigners. And then that project, or that company, didn't really do anything interesting in energy storage for the next decade. Um, and so the lesson learned there, again, is 
we didn't really take into account the audience that we were, that we were speaking to. And that in energy, um, a single set of executives with the strike of a pen can put back innovation for a half a decade or more. Um, and that may be wrong and unfortunate, but it is the reality that we face. Um, however, take heart because, as I said before, uh, utilities and energy companies are willing to spend money and significant amounts of money on uh, projects, whether it be pilot projects or just R&D or research um, in the blockchain space or, or, or just in, in new things. Uh, Again, globally, you, most IPPs and most distributors, most utilities have an obligation, whether it's by law, regulation, or custom, to spend a certain percentage of their revenue on R&D. If you go across the world, this represents billions of dollars of pent-up capital. There's lots of companies out there looking to spend money on pilot projects. It may mean that you're not going to, say, implement a project at the distribution level tomorrow, but you can get funding tomorrow for, for whatever you want to do at the distribution level. So it doesn't, so while I kind of bring a bit of caution here with respect to rollout, um, there's a lot of money at, uh, on the table to, you know, to develop your vision and, and, and you know, and bring blockchain into, into energy systems. A um, couple of trends that are just sort of important to, to remember. Um, going forward, you know, I don't know when the date is. We, I've done a lot of analysis on this, um, or we have in our companies in the past. At some point, the level of cost of energy of solar plus some form of solid state battery is going to be the primary solution for generation. I mean, if you think that Something uh, I wish it wasn't the case because my background was in wind, um, but I often find myself calling wind sort of the VCR of, of renewable energy, something that was popular for a very short period of time and then was eventually replaced by something that didn't have as m much um, or ha have as many mechanical parts and was just much more efficient um, in deployment. Um, but again, the reality is that sometime between 2022 and 2026, Solar will become the lowest cost of energy among all forms of generation. Um, I don't know how that is a debatable point. Um, if you think that it's, I mean, whether you believe in the renaissance of nuclear or, or clean coal or uh, cheap gas over the long term um, or some of the, uh, these other wonderful fables, you know, I wish you luck in that, in that thesis, but this is the reality. Um, solar follows Moore's law and Moore's law will eventually dominate energy. Um, with respect to blockchain and how we kind of fit this into energy, if you're looking at, say, registry, like high frequency registry of energy usage or high frequency trading and energy markets, blockchain's probably not an interesting solution um, until we have various forms of POS. So that's like 2019 and beyond. Um, and, the, you know, it, over time this will change, but, but this is the reality. Um, tokens, which is something that we spend a lot of time on uh, internally at Polychain, is a really interesting funding mechanism. Uh, we're really excited about it enabling communities and co-ops to kind of own their own generation assets or own their own um, energy systems within that community. Maybe they can even tie it to their real estate assets and then realize value as they transfer, um, you know, transfer ownership of essentially their, their real assets within a community. That's really interesting. But um, a couple things that we look for when we look at tokens is that the token is central and necessary to the blockchain enabled network that it enables. Um, if it's just a rent-seeking token, it's probably going to be forked out of the system, and a rent-seeking token often is probably going to be characterized as a security um, more easily uh, and more frequently. Um, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done around governance. So governance is a really interesting space in, in blockchain. We're really excited about it over the long term, but we have to recognize that um, we're very, very early in, in governance, uh, or blockchain token governance anyways. Um, and 
what we like, for example, is like one of our portfolio projects, uh, MakerDAO. So they've they have the vision of implementing governance into their system, but have recognized that, that the technology just isn't there. So they do simulated governance today, and then have kind of a, a group of, uh, sort of this group of benevolent dictators that kind of implement what is essentially decided by within the group, um, but with some obvious backstops and, and rationality um, put in place. So. Uh, I think governance is something that's going to be really interesting. It's also going to have a big impact in, in blockchain energy systems. But um, again, we're just not there yet. Um, so some opportunities, kind of short term and long term, low hanging fruit. Uh, I like to cite one of my favorite quotes in blockchain over the last couple, or uh, certainly this year, um, from Tyler who said, and very poignantly, that blockchain will disrupt supply chain long before it disrupts finance. And that's a really interesting point, because while energy markets and, and energy systems may not be low-hanging fruit at this point, there's a lot of supply chain elements within the energy uh, business that will be disrupted very quickly. You can have better registry and control of, of assets, whether it be, you know, poles for distributors or, uh, or generators or, or uh, whatever it is on, on your, uh, you know, within your utility system. Uh, and that's kind of low-hanging fruit. That's pretty easy. You can implement that now. Um, like I said, co-op and community funding. So we can do token crowd raises for community-based projects um, so that, that a community can own their own generation assets. I think that's pretty, you know, that's implementable now. Um, there's some excitement around that. We've seen crowdfunding of energy systems in the past. It hasn't got traction at, say, utility scale level, but it's sort of mezzanine level. You're kind of 500 kilowatt to 2 megawatt systems. That's doable and, you know, probably going to be pretty interesting going forward. Um, and then something that we're really excited about and, and I think is sort of an under research space right now in blockchain is reputation. Um, and you can tokenize reputation. And we have this distributed group of, of consultants that work in, in energy across the world. And there's no real standard for reputation or for recognition of quality. Uh, and that can be tokenized and standardized pre pretty easily. And I think it should be because there's a lot of charlatans um, in sort of the, the, the energy consulting space. Um, longer term, obviously, decentralized energy trading across markets is very compelling. Um, dramatically more efficient carbon credit markets. So I'll get into carbon credits and that, that issue in a minute. Your prosumer, and this, I, I should cite, uh, the prosumer uh, moniker comes from, coin, uh, from consensus. Uh, they've done some great work early on here in, in energy. And uh, this is essentially somebody who produces and consumes energy. And then the relationship with that and the grid and how that's managed will be um, a blockchain-based uh, blockchain solution. Um, and maybe that's not something that's very near term, but certainly in the next couple of years, we'll, we'll obviously be hearing more about that. Um, and then uh, again, I had I mentioned a little bit about governance and, and how that will sort of play a role both in how we control utilities um, and how we control our, our energy systems. So uh, one last thing I, I'd like to mention is not low-hanging fruit, but very compelling and, and something that seems very obvious to me over the long term. So today our carbon credit markets are totally broken um, with an incentivization system that doesn't make any sense at all. So you have a group of, of consultants all around the world and they are paid by the project that they will allocate credits to or allocate a, nece uh, a necessity of buying credits to. So uh, that, that obviously changes incentives for them. Um, and what we see is that if you have a 100 megawatt project in Brazil and you have a 100 megawatt project in Spain and a 100 megawatt project in the US, all three will have a totally different carbon ratio. All three will be granted carbon credits 
at a totally different rate from one another, and I'm, I'm talking about normalizing for capacity factor and for efficiency and all, all these other things. Um, and in some markets, you see just frank, just outright fraud, and where in other markets, you have a little bit more professionalism. And then say if, if these uh, carbon credits are offset against a Chinese emitter, the actual carbon ratio of that Chinese emitter won't represent what their uh, what their pollution level is or what their actual environmental effect is. So the system is entirely broken, and what we've seen now numerous times in the past is it's created hyperinflation. You have very significant demand um, on the generation side, because if you're a, a generator, it, it's, it's just a bonus for you, these, these carbon credits. They're not, they don't actually factor into your P&L. So, um, whatever you get from them is something that you were you you know you weren't planning to get anyways, and so basically all generators will sign up for for carbon credits, but emitters will only sign up for carbon credits if they're required by law, or required by some moral obligation. Uh, the latter being fairly rare, obviously. Um, so you've got an excessive amount of of demand on the generation side. This creates an excessive supply of carbon credits and then you get hyperinflation. So what we saw in Euro 1, Euro 2 was hyperinflation in line with you know, Venezuelan inflation. Um, so clearly the, 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 the system is broken. Um, it's based on incentives. Um, and it's also based on the fact that the carbon ratio is something that everybody decides for themselves. So the carbon ratio is sort of what the actual environmental effect is of a project and then how many uh, carbon credits should be issued to that project or sh that project should purchase and retire based on their carbon ratio. Um, so what I propose, and I've written sort of a white paper for this and anybody can have it if they want to run with this project. Um, uh, you, you can find me after and I'll send you all the information that I have on this. Uh, and there, uh, there's also a number of consultants um, including GL, that have expressed interest in participating in something like this. But um, I propose a globally distributed group of verifiers. Uh, these consultants exist today. They just sort of need to onboard to a system. They all agree upon a carbon ratio algorithm, so how you decide carbon ratio of different projects globally. Um, a consultant will go out to a project, verify a given project, propose that to the collective of verifiers. The collective of verifiers will then um, agree to the carbon ratio. And then you can tie that, because with blockchain, you can tie that directly into the SCADA. And the SCADA system can produce these carbon credits over time uh, the way that they should be done. And obviously, flip side, um, an emitter can have, have an, uh, a verifier come and verify propose it to the collective, it's voted on, reputation is distributed to the, to the collectors based on this, and then again, tied into the SCADA, and as the emitter emits, they're acquiring the tokens on an open market to retire. And so you have a, a, a creation and retirement of tokens on an open market, but it makes a lot more sense because you're gonna have a globally agreed upon um, carbon ratio and prevent hyperinflation. Uh, which is the problems that we've seen in the in the carbon credit market. So I think I'm basically out of time. Um, but if anybody wants to uh, reach out with questions or or complaints or or whatever, that, that's my contact, and I'll be around the rest of the day. Also, the breakout session as well. Sure. Yeah. The breakout session is in what room? I don't have your exact. I think it's three twelve. That sounds right. Yeah. So thanks.